Welcome to Milling About, a one-of-a-kind show that brings the best of Minneapolis right into your home. I'm your host, Brianna Rose. Today we'll be speaking with Martha Archer, the Executive Director of the Mill City Farmers Market, to find out what the remainder of the market season will look like. We'll have some laughs with local comedian Toby Grace, and then we'll hear what it's like to do large art projects along the river with Sarah Peters, the Director of Northern Lights MN. This month we're bringing you a new segment that we're calling Local Eats, and we'll talk to X from Pinku Japanese Street Food. After that, Be That Neighbor will be back with another community member that's making a difference. And to finish it up, we'll meander through time with Michael Rainville Jr. and learn about the haunting of Maple Hill. I'm excited for today's show, and I hope you are too. Welcome to today's What's Fresh at the Farmer's Market segment. Today we have Martha Archer, uh, the D Executive Director of the Mill City Farmer's Market. Welcome, Martha. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you again. So we are full swing into fall, which seems kind of hard to believe. It came up really fast. And I'm just wondering how much longer will we have the Mill City Farmer's Market? We run outdoors every Saturday through October, and this year the last Saturday is Halloween. Uh, in October, we switch our market our hours from nine to one, so a little later, just because the sun comes up a little later and it mm -hmm. tends to be a little colder. Um, but it's harvest season, so the tables are fuller than they have been all season. That's really exciting. Will we find things like pumpkins and stuff for carving and for also for baking? Are those the kinds of things that uh, vendors might have? Absolutely. Pumpkins and squash are already coming in um, in the truckloads. Uh, we've got quite a lot of squash and pumpkins and wonderful apple selections. Um, so all vegetables are here. Wonderful. And so I know that in years past, the, the farmer's market has gone on through the winter, but it's moved indoors. What will the winter market look like this year? We're working to pivot again um, to keep our community and our vendors and our farmers as safe as possible. So this winter we've decided to hold the winter market outdoors, um, similarly to the way we did it in March and April. Um, we'll have a couple of vendors inside the train shed, but the Mill City Museum will be closed throughout the winter. So um, we're going to just put a few vendors with very perishable produce and products indoors and the rest of the vendors will be in the train shed. Um, and it's going to be festive. It's going to be, this is going to be the way we're all going to, you know, be able to socialize and see each other. We'll be outdoors safely this winter. I know a lot of grocery stores are running very smoothly indoors, but for our farmers who, this is often their only contact with um, a lot of other people, mm -hmm. we're really trying to keep our local food system safe. So being outdoors is, um, as you all know, the safest way to interact. And um, so we're gonna work on providing as many creature comforts as possible, some propane heaters and hand warmers for our hardworking farmers and vendors and uh, encourage pre-orders, but we'll also have plenty of options for um, walk-up sales. Wonderful, and I mean, we live in Minnesota, we're Minnesotans, we're used to, you know, getting a little cold and if we layer and dress appropriately, it can be actually a really fun activity to do in the winter. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to visiting as well. Um, now, I understand that the market provides um, a crucial source of income for our vendors and just wondering, how can people support the makers and vendors at the Mill City Farmers Market? The most important thing is just is shopping, is um, really putting your dollar where your values are. And if that is the local food system, it's really directly supporting these farmers and makers um, by shopping the market. And so, you know, figure, thinking about what portion of your weekly grocery budget do you want to allocate to them uh, and using pre-orders to ensure that they know when they're coming to market, they've already have a portion of that product sold, really helps mm -hmm. them build confidence and know that it's gonna be really a worthwhile trip into the city um, and worthwhile to stand outside for three hours um, and um, sell their goods. So um, their livelihood, many of our vendors, this is either you know half to a third of their income, a couple, you know, some of them do wholesale, but mm -hmm. um, it's a, a huge percentage of their income and to have it, be down, the traffic down um, really cuts into their livelihood and could jeopardize them continuing to stay in business as well as the market continuing to operate. So we're doing everything we can to support them. Yeah, it sounds like it. And again, I think that, 
you know, it might be a little cold, but it will be a really fun way for people to get outdoors in the winter and still support our um, farmers and our makers through the season and through this pandemic. So I'm exactly. glad to hear, I'm glad to hear that, um, you know, it'll still go on for the winter. Well, we, we're so fortunate to have the Mill City Museum train shed and that mm -hmm. bit of shelter. So we'll be able to be in there, um, you know, physically spaced and, you know, with all of our PPP on, but um, we'll be um, ready to sell the produce and support the vendors. And, and there'll be plenty of root vegetables, meat vegetables, um, meat, cheese, bread. So, you know, almost a full grocery cart of options. Wonderful. Well, thanks again for joining us, Martha. And we look forward to seeing you at the farmer's market. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we'll see you put on your favorite car hard or jacket. <laughs> we'll mittens and we'll see you there. Little scarf. Yes. All right. Exactly. Thank you. We'll scarf and your mask. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thanks Martha. So much. We're here with local comedian Toby Grace. Toby, it's great to have you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so you're one of approximately 200 um, local comedians who mm -hmm. um, are probably somewhat out of work right now due to COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, com completely out of work. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering how uh, you're dealing with that. Well, I think me personally, um, at the beginning, it wasn't too bad because, you know, you could sit back, have a couple of quarantinis and however you wanted to just kind of relax throughout the middle of all this. Um, mm -hmm. But as it's dragged on, as it's become very political, I think it's been a big stretch on a lot of people's mental health, especially in the comedian community, which I don't know if it'll come as a surprise to anybody, but mental health tends to be at a deficit in that community to begin with. So the added stress hasn't been particularly helpful to a lot of people. I can imagine. Um, so we have a clip um, from one of your recent comedy routines where you address COVID and, and I think that we will end our interview here and cut over to that. Thank yeah, you so absolutely. much for uh, mm -hmm. being with us today. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Toby Grace and there is no way to cold open this. There's no crowd work to do. There's no applause. You're just literally talking, trying to build in some kind of rhythm, some kind of vocal cadence that will actually get you from one side of a four minute set to the other side of a four minute set. There really isn't anything that makes this feel normal or natural or even funny. Like as I'm doing this, I'm not having fun and I like to believe that it shows. Instead I'm nervous because we're all just trying to reach out to the world at this point and I don't really see a way to connect with people in the middle of this pandemic. You can't hug a stranger. Not that I ever really hugged strangers before. Been tempted. I mean, there's no way to make it not sound creepy, but there is also a way to admit, like, you can see somebody on the street and think, they're a good hugger. They know how to make you feel safe in their arms. The thing that is hardest is trying to look at the bright side of things. Because when you turn on the news and you see that 200,000 people are dead, and that's another thing, you don't like actually using the real number because of course everything gets dated and then you're always afraid that people are like, well, is he just not paying attention to that? Or is he overinflating it? So you feel like you're always having to try to walk the sweet spot between the language and between the number that you need to end up getting to. Like at this point, we're talking like 200,000, but at some point we could be talking like 400,000 or 600,000 or a million people and every number smaller than that will just feel utterly disrespectful and quaint. And then you kind of want wish that everything had a time stamped on this. Considering I'm doing this on my cell phone right now, I'm pretty sure there is some kind of metadata that I can go back to and use as some kind of proof. But I digress, I'm kind of getting off topic here. It's hard as we kind of re-enter society because there are some of us who are worried or take it very seriously and there are some of us who, you know, end up at videos in Costco. And as entertaining as those are to watch, and as much as I always take the Costco employee's side when they actually try to do something like, you know, protect other human life, um, which is usually something that we would turn to our government to do, but <laughs> these days, um, they're kind of the ones lighting the match. So what do we do when we're the ones who have to not 
just be inside and not just have to deal with all of this, but we end up being disconnected from our friends and family and from the humor that used to surround us. And it hit me just the other day when I was in a public place and I don't know what the current elevator etiquette that we're on is. I'd like to believe that if we're in a small elevator situation, what we need to agree on is one person per elevator or one you know contained group per elevator. But when we're at this point now where I get on the elevator and then like two other people on the next floor try to get on, I will exit the elevator to get off. And they will always give me a look at me like I am the rude one, not willing to share an elevator. And that's when it dawned to me in the annals of elevator health and elevator safety, where we have to go with this. And I realized something. If you don't believe that you can get infected by this virus just by traveling through the air, I want to remind you of something. Farting in enclosed spaces. Because if worse comes to worse and you're really trying to rub in the rudeness, it's pretty easy to look over at somebody and say, hey, if you can smell my farts, I can get you real sick. Thank you. And now I'm with Sarah Peters, the director of Northern Lights MN. Hi, Sarah. Great to have you. Hi. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so I was wondering if we could just start with you giving us an overview of exactly what Northern Lights MN is. Sure. NorthernLights.MN, we are a nonprofit arts organization and we support artists in the creation and presentation of new artworks in public spaces. Um, sometimes that's outside, but sometimes it's inside, sometimes that's on the internet. Um, we just like to work in places that are accessible to a lot of different people. Great, that's really interesting. Um, and so I know that you put on some really large um, art projects along the river. Can you tell us what the process is like to put on a project like that? Sure, um, yeah, we do large and small things, which is fun. Each different kind of project has a new challenge. Um, but for the past several years, we have been partnering with the Mississippi Park Connection and the National Park Service to present large scale artworks at the Upper St. Anthony Lock and Dam, um, which is a significant structure <laughs> that was closed to river navigation um, several years ago, I think in 2016, maybe. Um, yeah, that's right. Similar. And so, um, and we became familiar with that site from our festival, Northern Spark, which happens usually in June late into the night mm -hmm. and had taken place in the past in and around the Stone Arch Bridge. And so to put on our various projects, we do a lot of site scoping, walking around, taking a look, where could something take place? Where could we do a large projection? Where we might situate an interactive performance or installation? And so we, we spent a lot of time in that area and we're just so curious about this structure and how, how it functions. Um, and so we um, also had had a collaboration sort of ongoing from years past with Mississippi Park Connection, who was really interested in doing some kind of art projects to help get people interested in the river in other ways rather than traditional river education, which tends to focus on little kids going on field trips yes. or retired people who have time to volunteer and mm -hmm. do cleanups. They're kind of more interested in the everybody else who's not those two populations mm -hmm. and seeing if they could bring them into this experience of the river in an unconventional way. And so we thought, hey, that we love that. Um, and we love putting art in unconventional places. And so we, kind of struck up this collaboration that was really ushered through by a couple of other artists who had done a lot of work in that area. And were able to raise some funds through the St. Anthony Heritage Board that does a grant for interpretive projects in and around the Stone Arch Bridge area. And they have been the supporters of what has become the Illuminate the Lock program. Well, Should that is going? really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Keep going. What is oh. the Illuminate the Lock program? So that, um, that is a program where we invite artists to come in and, and do some sort of interactive 
uh, artwork inside the chamber of the lock. Um, now that it's not used for river navigation, it sits there for a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. The National Park Service runs a visitor center there and they do other programming. But we have learned that artists are very curious about this space and are interested also in the river and in the history of the lock and want to do projects about that. And so the first year we did kind of a call for uh, proposals and we sent that out to a targeted number of artists in our community and they proposed project ideas and then we assembled a, a jury and we selected two and those were produced the very first year. And that was Aaron Dysart who did a project called Surface which was light um, and fog machines inside of the lock chamber. Very and cool. Andrea Carlson made a um, hand-drawn animated video using vintage photographic footage from um, Spirit Island, which used to be in the middle of the river. Um, and that became a, a, a scrolling video that was projected onto the side of the lock wall. Well, what a great use of a space that hasn't been used anymore. Thank you so much for your time today, Sarah. Yeah, you're welcome. See you soon. Thanks. Bye. We're here today with Xiao Tang Wang, also known as X, the managing partner of Pinku Japanese Street Food. Hi, X. Great to have you. Hello, and uh, thanks for having me here. So I understand that you're coming to us from Yale, where you're doing a graduate program. Um, what made you decide to go back to grad school? So part of the reason why I started Pinku Japanese was to challenge myself uh, to learn about things that I'm passionate about, uh, to self-improve. Uh, and I think, you know, we've been open for just over four years now. And uh, we're very fortunate to have a, a great team of people, employees, managers uh, at our restaurant. So at some point, you know, you kind of just have to, uh, have to let go and, and, and let someone else run the show. Um, mm -hmm. So we're very fortunate uh, with that. And, uh, and I felt like it was a good time for me to step away a little bit and, uh, and continue to learn about other things, about other industries. And, uh, and coming to a school like Yale to get my MBA has always been a life, life goal of mine. Um, so I, I'm very happy to be here. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm not, definitely not um, apart from the restaurant. I do speak with my team every week. You know, we talk about our specials and schedules and everything. Uh, so I do stay very close involved uh, with Pink in Minneapolis. Well, it sounds like you have a lot on your plate and you're accomplishing a lot already with not only a restaurant, but realizing a dream of uh, going to graduate school at Yale. So that is really, really cool. I'm wondering with Pinku, how are you guys adapting to the challenges that um, the restaurant industry is facing with COVID? So I think the key word is being nimble. And, uh, and when we started the restaurant, uh, we wanted to create a small, intimate environment where you're close to the kitchen, um, close to the food, how it's being made. And of course, with COVID, uh, that whole entire philosophy contradicts with the current environment. Uh, so we had to pivot uh, significantly in the other direction. So we had to go from uh, primarily dining in uh, to takeouts and going from uh, indoor dining to outdoor patio. And we never even had a patio. So um, we just had to be creative and act fast. So we got uh, a few uh, patio furniture uh, from our uh, next door neighbor, got some umbrellas. Uh, and our patio has been a huge success. Um, but as everyone in Minnesota knows <laughs> that winter season is approaching. Okay. So uh, we'll see how that, how that goes. Um, a lot of people have asked us whether we will open up uh, indoor dining anytime soon? Um, the question is, I don't know. Uh, we're still deciding. Uh, okay. But what I can tell you is that um, the decision really comes from the employees. You know, we not only do we want to make our uh, customers safe uh, coming in, mm -hmm. but more importantly, we want to make sure that employees feel safe coming to work. Uh, so actually this week, uh, that is something that I have uh, asked my employees, every single one of them. Um, are you uh, how do you feel about uh, having customers coming in? And, uh, and I can tell you the only way that we will open uh, dine-in is if all of our employees are, um, are okay with it, are comfortable with it. Um, the most important thing for me is, you know, we can't always prioritize uh, profit um, over people. 
We have about one minute left. And I was just wondering, do you feel like there's anything um, that's happened in your life to prepare you uniquely to face challenges like this and be ready for them? So I think part of that comes from my family. Uh, um, you know, my, my parents actually uh, moved here from China uh, about 20, uh, actually 30 years ago to get their uh, graduate degrees. Uh, so I'm actually very much following their path. And my mom was an English teacher in China. And of course, you're not going to become an English uh, teacher here uh, <laughs> coming from China. So she went back to undergrad to study computer science. And as you can imagine, going from English to computer, not an easy transition. Not but she all. did it uh, because that's the only way to be able to get a job here, to, to survive here, uh, to immigrate here legally. Um, so, you know, they went through a lot of challenges and I think I definitely have learned a lot from them and I'm using the same philosophy uh, in terms of how I run um, the business and in terms of how I carry on my life. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, X. We really appreciate it and good luck with your studies. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Bye. For today's Be That Neighbor segment, Claudia Kitak, the director of Be That Neighbor, will be interviewing Iqbal Abdi. Claudia, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Brianna. It is my pleasure to introduce Iqbal to the audience. Um, Iqbal and I met when she was part of our Mill City Players. She was an amazing actress. Mm -hmm. And now I've discovered she's an amazing community activist. So Iqbal, Talk to the people about what you are doing to be that neighbor. Mm, that's, that's a really good question, being that neighbor. Um, currently, me and a lot of group of youth in the community, in the Cedar Rosa community, are working on community outreach teams that are there to be um, that neighbor, there to protect and build relationships, build relations with the elderly. Um, for example, like yesterday, there was a um, man who's uh, a Somali man who's a part of the Olympics um, back like 20, 30 years ago. And he was creating a team um, of elderly to stretch. And we was, the youth, um, including myself, was there stretching with the um, older folks. And it was, it was an amazing experience. So from things like just building relationships with the elderly and the younger kids, the children, so making sure that they have mentors, to actually being the um, front line, you know, almost like security guards for the neighborhood when George Floyd um, Pat was murdered and there was um, white supremacists who was threatening the Cedar Side neighborhood, we as a youth came together and was protecting and built bar barricades um, on the streets with our own cars because we don't have resources, but when what being that neighbor really is, is being able to step up and, and help your community when you are needed most. And you take that to mean whatever comes up, you're going to respond. Am I correct? Exactly, exactly. And you told me before that you had done some work with some young girls. Do you want to talk about what you've been doing with young girls? Yes. So um, I work at YCB. It's a youth outreach team um, funded by the city of Minneapolis. And we work about two to three days a week in the community. So at the park, um, Curry Park, there was a group of young, from the age of three, I believe, to like 14 year old girls, right? And um, they saw me, I saw them, I approached them, we were talking and they were, they like, they were fascinated because they, they don't see a lot of older girls going to the park and making time with the youth, right? Um, so I would play games with them. And then I'd also, they'd say stuff like, why aren't you wearing makeup? And I'm like, cause I don't need to wear makeup. I am beautiful the way I am. And by saying those little things, it's showing them that they are beautiful just the way that they are. And at the end of the night, I remember one of the girls um, went to her mom and then she came to me and she said, come, come talk to my mom. And when I talked to her mother, she was like, you're, this girl, like you're her mentor, like she looks up to you. And I was like, I did it, <laughs> looks up to what? Like, what are you talking about? And then the mother was like, um, the daughter said that she wants to be like you when she grows up and that she's teaching um, me and the other girls, I'm teaching the younger girls how to be brave. And when she said that, I was like, whoa, like, I didn't even, like, that was not even like what I was going for, but like, 
it exceeded my expectations from those few minutes that I'm spending time and actually talking to these young girls. So it was just a crazy experience. That's Thank you. That's amazing, Iqbal. Thank you so much. I appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you, Thank you as well. Thanks, Clara and Iqbal. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Meandering Through Time with Michael Rainville Jr., our history columnist. Nice to have you again, Michael. Likewise, it's good to see you, good to be back. So last month, you took us meandering through time, uh, back to the 1930s, where we heard about the exploits of the Barker Carpus Gang. What do you have in store for us this month? So in the spirit of the Halloween season, I'd like to talk about Beltrami Park in Northeast Minneapolis or as it was originally called, Maple Hill Cemetery. Back in 1857, Minneapolis had a population of 3,400, and the town of St. Anthony had about 5,000. There were no desi designated places to lay loved ones to rest, so St. Anthony chose a small hill in the northeast outskirts of the town for the city's first cemetery. From 1857 until its closure in 1890, the cemetery saw roughly 5,000 burials, some of which were Civil War veterans. Maple Hill was a, a popular place to lay loved ones to rest on the east side of the river because of its easy access, beautiful and peaceful scenery, and cheap costs. However, cheap costs also meant cheap labor. Not all of the departed were buried six feet under, and in fact, many were resting merely two feet under the surface. This would lead to problems that some might say are still lingering atop that hill this very day. From 1890 to 1916, the cemetery was left for Mother Nature to reclaim. During the first few years of its closure, 1,300 caskets were moved by their families to either Hillside Cemetery or Lakewood Cemetery. That still leaves 3,700 unclaimed bodies. Oh. At first, it was still a nice and calm cemetery, but as rain began to erode parts of the hill, those two-foot graves began to peek out of the ground a little bit. Grave robbers would frequent the old cemetery, and do you know what resting souls hate more than hooligans from Northeast who are stealing their belongings? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It's just the worst. So the neighbors had their complaints heard about the dilapidated cemetery uh, that would attract the unsavory crowd in 1908, and the Minneapolis Park Board bought the land and turned it into Maple Hill Park. The Park Board didn't update anything in the park for quite a few years, which angered the neighborhood even more. In 1916, a group of neighbors moved many of the remaining tombstones and invisible caskets and threw them into a ditch nearby. Soon after, the park board started to take the park more seriously. They removed the rest of the tombstones, except for a couple grave markers, and a memorial for the 46 Civil War veterans who were laid to rest there. Wow. I, well, for one, I didn't know that there used to be a cemetery where, where Beltrami Park is now. And also, I had no idea that that area was so old. So what did they do with those remaining tombstones? I wasn't able to find out any records of what the park board did with the remaining tombstones, um, or precisely what they did, I should say. Uh, however, I do know the whereabouts of at least one of them. Many decades ago, a neighbor of my great-grandfather's was redoing their front steps, and my great-grandfather great noticed that the first step looked a little unusual. So he flipped it over and lo and behold, it was a tombstone for the man, for a man by the name of Louis Ledoux. His neighbor said he could have it and it's been in the family ever since. Now, was Louis a victim of the irritated neighbors who threw tombstones into a ditch or did the park board <laughs> carefully remove his? We'll never know and it seems that only Louis knows that answer. Well, that is a very unique family heirloom. I uh, hope you're keeping Louis's tombstone nice and safe. Oh, absolutely. In fact, we're planning on propping it up and planting a nice flower garden around it. What a great story and super appropriate for the season that we're in. Thank you for sharing. Well, you're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Okay, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Michael. Right. And that concludes today's show. I hope you'll join us next month when we have local musician, accordionist Dan Turpening, We'll speak with a representative from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. We'll be doing a small business spotlight and be speaking with Joe Amuda and Heidi Henriksen of the Minneapolis Boxing Club. Be That Neighbor will be back with another community member making a difference. And of course, we'll have more local history and meander through time with Michael Rainville Jr. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next month.